Great. So my talk today is about accessibility on Android or how to make apps for everyone. My name is Pamela Hill. I'm an Android engineer and tech lead at the cryptocurrency company called Luno. And you can find me at PamelaAHill.com. And I also have, well, I'm also on Twitter, so you can tweet at me. My handle is at PamelaAHill. Welcome. <laughs> Let's have a look at the topics that I'll be covering today. So first we'll really have a look at what is accessibility and why is it really, really important. And we're going to have a case, we're going to make a case that you can present to your product owner to say, hey, it's really important to make the app accessible and here's why. So I'll explain the different kinds of disabilities that there are and um, how it affects how different folks interact with your app, disab disabled folks interact with your app, and also the tools that Android actually provides to assist these folks. And um, creating an accessible app starts in the design phase. So we'll be looking at some design uh, tips and hints for making our designs more accessible. And I'll also explain the Android accessibility services and how we can make sure that our apps are nicely optimized to make sure that disabled folks can really have a great experience using um, our apps via these services. But I'll explain what they are a little bit later. And then we'll look at some cool tools from Google um, that will help you test and verify the accessibility of your app. So you might have heard the term accessibility and understood it as enabling disabled folks, permanently disabled folks, to access technology. But it actually has a much broader scope. So according to Wikipedia, the source of all truth, right? Um, accessibility is the design of products, devices, services and environments that would work to include everyone. But everyone also includes folks that have temporal or situational impairments, such as a broken arm, or if they're carrying something heavy. And age-related conditions also fall within the scope of accessibility. But how important is accessibility, really? Well, according to the World Health Organization, 15% of the world's population actually lives with some form of a disability. So I'd say accessibility is really, really important. Considering the statistic of 15% um, of the world's population, and considering that we're not actually making apps that are accessible, why? What do we really think when we think about accessibility? I think perhaps we feel we don't know enough to actually make our apps accessible. About We don't know enough about disabilities. And perhaps we think that we can cram more and more features into our apps to give the majority of our users a great user experience. And maybe that's good enough. Or perhaps we think that we can make I shouldn't move. Okay. Perhaps we think that we should we can make our apps accessible later. So actually the hardest thing about accessibility is the willingness to do it. So maybe I've convinced you that accessibility is the right thing to do. But what about your product owner? I see my product owner at the back of the room. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so how do you convince them? Well, firstly, it's just the right thing to do. Nobody likes being excluded, right? And by not making our apps accessible, we are excluding folks from using technology. Accessibility also benefits everyone, not just disabled folks, because the way that we design apps that are accessible is very simple and very clear and very much to the point. It can also be a big business opportunity, considering this huge portion of the um, world's population that actually is affected and the fact that we're not actually catering for them. There's, there's a gap in the market. 
So it can be a key differentiator in a very ad competitive app marketplace. The app marketplace is cutthroat, so it can be a key differentiator. So according to the accessibility project, there are four different categories of disabilities. Now there's visual, auditory, motor, and cognitive. But some other sources actually include neurological speech, and I would actually like to, if I may, include mental illness. So let's have a look at how these different disabilities actually inter, um, what they are, and how it affects how different people, how disabled folks interact with your app, and also how, what tools Android provides to assist them. So visual impairments include those with no or limited or obstructed vision. And um, this would include conditions like myopia or glaucoma or colorblindness. Colorblindness is very, very common. And folks with these disabilities use screen readers or magnifiers, or they change their operating system settings to read. So Android actually provides a myriad of options um, for, to assist these folks. There's TalkBack, which we'll be looking at a little bit later. It's a screen reader. It reads through your screen. Um, Lookout, which sounds really cool, uses computer vision to recognize and communicate um, objects and takes an environment of interest. And BrailleBack, which uses a refreshable Braille display that you can... Um, you can read, and then also a Braille keyboard that you can type and navigate with. There's an easily accessible screen magnifier tool. There's um, settings that you can use to change the, the contrast and the size of your text. And there's also color correction settings for um, the various forms of color blindness. Color blindness isn't just red and green differentiation. There's, there's actually like three or four different kinds of color blindness. Auditory impairments include no or limited hearing or difficulty processing auditory information. And folks with these kinds of disabilities use visual content or captions for audio. Now, Android provides this. It has live captioning for captioning media and live transcribe for, transcribe for transcribing, essentially speak, um, speech and sounds, and then there's also a sound amplifier that you can control the different um, elements of sound in the environment. Motor impairments, um, that includes repetitive stress injury, something that we programmers tend to be a little bit at risk for. Um, cerebral palsy, Parkinson's, and muscular dystrophy. And people with these kinds of disabilities use alternative keyboards, eye trackers, or a device called a switch. Now, Rebecca knows about switch. She wrote an article a long time ago about it. Um, it's basically a device that has two buttons. The one that you use to navigate with. So as you, as you want to move across the screen, just keep on tapping it. And then another button to select. So Android provides switch integration and also voice access um, to control the device with spoken commands. Cognitive impairments include um, Down syndrome, autism, and dyslexia. And folks with these kinds of impairments use easy-to-process information. Um, I couldn't really find anything on Android that would help, but perhaps, perhaps soon. Um, neurological impairments include flashing or um, conditions where the like flashing or moving visuals actually trigger seizures in people. So um, folks with these kinds of disabilities use settings on their phones to reduce motion. Something to keep in mind if you have animation as part of your storytelling of your Android app. Speech impairments for, is, is basically when you have difficulty expressing or understanding language. Um, and folks with these disabilities use text-to-speech. So the late prof, um, Professor Stephen Hawking used a muscle in his cheek um, to control a very specialized um, 
computer, and that allowed him to, thankfully, we're very grateful for that, he could conduct interviews and write. So folks with these disabilities use things like a text-to-speech tool or real-time text with calls on the Android platform. And finally, we've got um, the mental illness category, which includes depression, anxiety, bipolar, psychosis, and dementia. Now, it's really easy and wrong to dismiss um, these kinds of illnesses with, as too specialized to actually practically take into consideration, or not debilitating enough to actually warrant special attention. So, Luckily, there are a few sources of research, and I hope to be give, giving some hints and tips that we can actually use to um, accommodate these folks and assist these folks. Um, and they are more design issues. There's unfortunately nothing on the Android platform that helps um, um, assist folks with disabilities like this. So, sadly, Android doesn't help, um, doesn't provide anything to assist folks with cognitive disabilities and mental illnesses. So I'm hoping one day, with the rise of in machine learning, that there'll be something that will transform hard to process information to something that's easier to process for folks with cognitive disabilities. But at the moment, Android is essentially delegating that responsibility to developers and designers to kind of cater for these kinds of um, assistance. And sadly, all too often that falls to the wayside. So accessibility starts with design. And a designer with a real passion for accessibility can really create such a wonderful user experience for both abled and disabled folks. So Phil Weaver, the Android accessibility team lead at Google, who I secretly want to work for, don't tell anyone, <laughs> recently gave three rules for accessible designs for creating them. While this list isn't, it's not very long, so it's obviously not exhaustive, it's a great place to start. So he said, Make information visible, prefer simple and big controls, and label images precisely and concisely. So when we're designing for accessibility, we actually need to reconsider our aspects, our design aspects again, like copy, typography, color, and imagery and photography. And in my mind, Design is like a, a really delicate balance between form and function, between the need to be creative and unique and the need to be understandable and um, usable by everyone. So let's have a look at each of the design aspects in turn. Firstly, copy should be localized, I didn't know this, concise and descriptive. So. Localized copy will ensure that your non-native English speakers actually have the fighting chance, right? So they have limited English vocabulary, and now we're expecting them to um, reuse screen readers that are not understandable to them. Um, so it will help them to understand the app in their own language. And screen readers pretty much laboriously read through all your assistive text, so it's really important that it's concise and descriptive. And screen readers also will tell you what the, what the, state, um, the state and the type of control is. So it's actually not necessary to um, announce or to give assistive text for that. When you decide on copy, um, think about, for instance, um, if you have a floating action button or fab, and you have a plus sign on it. What do you think would that mean? It's something like create item or add item. But why would you want to make your assistive text then plus or plus sign? So it's really important to be very much um, not use the literal meaning, but rather what the control actually does, what it actually means. So verbs, rather use a verb over a noun. 
The purpose of type typography is really to provide you with content. So readability is really, really important. So in terms of size, Android has a lint warning for any, which is just a warning to say, hey, your content description is, or your, your size is just a little bit too small, um, of about 12 SP, which is scale independent pixels. And that gives us a good rule of thumb for when our text sizes are too small, if we get that lint warning, right? So be aware, and this is something that we saw recently, of um, that you can actually adjust your operating system text sizes to be scaled. So it can be between 0.8 and 1.3 of the normal standard scale. You can, you can change the setting to be small or normal or stand or sort of a bit larger and then huge. And the problem that, that comes with that is that sometimes we actually don't test with that and we get text that overflows um, because we're using text that is larger than what we expected. Then in terms of font weights for font families, try not to use the light font. <laughs> I know most designers really, really love that lightweight font, but um, it's actually better to use something slightly heavier. And centered text, actually, try not to use centered text or justified text, because centered text, the, it increases the cognitive load that you actually place on folks with cognitive disabilities, because the text line, each line starts at a different place. Justified text, similarly, has different spaces between each word. So that also increases the cognitive load. So what do we do? Well, there's a lady called Tatiana Mack, and she suggests a really good alternative. You place your text in a box, you center the box, but you left align for left to right reading languages. You left align your text. So it gives the appearance of centered, the centeredness but it's still easy for those with cognitive disabilities to read. Um, for all caps, often, for all caps, um, often we use uh, that for call to action controls, but this is also difficult for those with cognitive disabilities to read. So try not to, to use that too much. Um, however, when you're an Android developer, make sure you use the Android um, attribute all caps rather than typing out, because screen readers will actually read the text as an abbreviation. So it will read, for instance, typography as D, Y, B, O, and that would just be insane. It must be so irritating. Color is really powerful. But be careful when you select your color palette. Um, the contrast ratio, so the contrast ratio is a really big thing. And um, the contrast ratio is how different one color appears from the other. And a good contrast ratio um, between your text and background can, is going to make the difference in terms of is it readable, is it not readable. So for smaller text, it's 4.5 to 1. For larger text, it's three to one. And the material design color tool actually helps you with this. It helps you, it lets you select your, your background color, and then it will tell you whether white or black text is readable or not. And, um, you know, often we think that it's just the various colors of gray that's maybe not readable. Um, you know, designers love gray. <laughs> But sometimes we actually will see with the Uber Eats app, we have white text on a green background and it's not working. Also be careful with visual cues. Um, folks with color blindness might not be able to determine if you, for instance, have an input form and you only outline the, the error part in red. You know, if they have that form of color blindness, they're not going to be able to determine where the error is. So don't just use color for visual cues. Also use text or an icon or some other way to help them see that error.
So most designers and developers know you have to have alternative text. You have to have a content description. And once again, this needs to be localized and concise and descriptive. But don't just expect the developer to thumb suck it. You know, especially a developer on a deadline is going to give bad copy. So rather provide um, provide <laughs> okay. provide a content description as micro copy um, instead of developing or asking the developer to actually go and write that copy themselves. And then finally, designing for mental illness. Now, this is unexplored territory, pretty much. Um, I know I've seen some research done by a UK council, but I haven't really seen that much. But I've had a few conversations with people that are in the mental health industry and know about these things, and they've given me a few suggestions. So, for example, for folks with anxiety disorders, clear instructions, more help, and um, more information when they need it will provide um, a lot of comfort to them and also help with easing that anxiety. Impulse control problems, um, for instance, conditions like bipolar affective disorder in a manic state, um, will benefit from cues to stop, consider, and then act. Um, especially for actions that are like online shopping that's not easily cancelable or reversible, like a sale on Black Friday. So let's have a look at how devices like Switch can be integrated with your app. So our app, our user needs to be able to view and interact with your app. But do we have to integrate every single device with our app? No. Android framework is there to the rescue. So mostly what our app needs to do is um, just to do a few tweaks here and there to present information properly to the user. So you know, you probably all know this, the content description one, but what you probably didn't know is you actually don't always have to provide a content description. If that image is decorative, it's not necessary. Why would you want to why would anyone, in, if you place yourself in a, um, somebody that's using a screen reader's shoes, want to hear this laborious kind of um, assistive text about, you know, it's a green chair with um, a, a book, a library background. You know, it's just a decorative item. It's not important. So you can just use the, the attribute important for accessibility equals no. And then you'll get rid of that lint warning. So the Android accessibility services work really well with standard components. So use them as much as possible. But um, so in other words, if you're using, if you're making your own custom views, be aware that you're probably going to have to test and make sure that it's working really well with accessibility services. So, for example, a view. Sometimes we use a custom dialog um, with a, with a specific title instead of the alert dialog or some other Android dialog. And um, we actually need to, in in terms of the accessibility services, announce to the, the on, the on the screen reader, announce that the dialog is popping up, what the title is, and also to announce when it closes. So we can use the set accessibility pane title um, function to, to convey that to the user. So sometimes text views have clickable links, and in order for that to become accessible, we need to use um, the world's longest function name called, <sighs> let me just breathe before this one, <laughs> enable accessible clickable span support. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. All right, so that's what you would use for making your clickable spans more accessible. Sometimes we have control like a YouTube player that has another control inside of it that disappears after a while. Like on our YouTube player, for instance, 
we would have that play control that disappears after a while. But how do you decide on a timeout? You know, you might be nimble-fingered, and, you know, maybe five seconds is fine. But how do you decide on a good default for folks with other abilities than you? Well, the, luckily, there's um, some support for that on the Accessibility Manager, where you can use the Get Recommended Timeout in Milliseconds um, function that will give us a timeout and also takes in the type of control. Um, so it's the, your kind of rough idea and also the type of control that you give that function and it will give you a better default timeout. And then finally, sometimes we have we need custom interactions, and for this there's a um, there's a, another accessibility um, function called Add Accessibility Action that you give a view, a, some assistive text, and also what it does. So you can actually go and try your app for yourself. Um, you can try you can use your phone. Go into settings and use the accessibility services um, section. And you can use Talkback, you can use Switch. Talkback um, will read to you all the text on the screen. And um, Switch you can use with your volume controls. So you just need to enable it on your phone and you can test some stuff. So with, Switch, with Talkback, you just swipe to navigate forward or backward, and you double tap to select something. And it's pretty interesting to see um, if you navigate through your favorite apps and you can see what the pitfalls are and try not to make them. So I used my favorite app, as you can see, Uber Eats, <laughs> with TalkBack. And it took me five minutes to order something, the Fusion Crunch Platter from Ocean Basket. Thank you very much. Um, that I ordered at the same restaurant from before. And it was really easy to find the restaurant and the item, but I could not for the life of me get it in that stupid cart. And I could not make a payment. It took me five minutes, guys. Wow. So some of the controls weren't labeled. Um, the reason for, for, the, for the delay in um, getting that item to the cart was that I had chosen my item, and then I had to swipe through the entire menu or know that because the, the button for adding the item is at the bottom. So I had to swipe through the entire menu, or know that I actually have to go back, you know, swipe back and then circle around <laughs> to, get that, to get to the right button. And the same thing with the cart. It was just really, really difficult to use. So some controls weren't labeled. Some text was read literally. So... For example, um, a very cheap restaurant is labeled as R, whereas an expensive restaurant is read RRR, which sounds kind of piratey and must be quite confusing. So some control states are also not known or they're not, it doesn't tell you when it's activated or that you're navigating it. And then the tipping or um, the tipping and the rating dialog pops up, um, doesn't tell you that it's there, and um, obstructs the entire view, so you have no idea what's, what's going on. And then, luckily, there's a, a, a couple of tools from Google that actually helps us to detect and find our problems. So there's a Play, um, Play Store uh, app called Accessibility Scanner, called, um, and you can just download it, and it will scan any screen and find some accessibility issues for you, like content labels that are missing, touch target sizes, clickable items, and text and image co contrast issues. So here we have Uber Eats. That's the home page. And on Accessibility Scanner, you can see at the top, the pickup label is actually really light gray. So there was just really insufficient contrast for that label. The drop-down sizes were too small, they were custom and unsupported, so we could actually not use those drop-downs on, on um, TalkBack at all. And the favorites button is also very small. For the wonderful Fusion Crunch Platter, 
The drop-down touch target was too small. They're sort of in the middle of the screen. There's strange hidden text on the button. And the text contrast was also really insufficient. Remember I spoke about the white, but white text on the green button? That's a no-no. OK. And then the pre-launch report is something that you can get on the Play Console. It has an accessibility section. So before you launch your app, you can actually see if there's any accessibility issues. Um, so once, once you've uploaded your app, you can, see, you can take screenshots. Um, well, it takes screenshots for you. It runs through your app. And it identifies some accessibility issues for you, such as touch target sizes, content labels that aren't there, low contrast, and other stuff. So the real pur purpose of my talk wasn't just to impart knowledge to you today, but rather to get you to be an accessibility ally with me. I hope that you've become excited about the prospect of really affecting positive social change by advocating for accessibility on your apps. So I've compiled a research document on my, on my blog, and all the research that I've done for this talk and all the other reading that I've done is on there, and you'll be able to read it, follow some people that knows about accessibility much more than what I do, ladies like Sarah Swaidan and so on, um, and really have a look at the courses and so on that's on there. <laughs>